So our next lecture, uh, to give kind of the short definition, is about European imperialism, and we'll be covering a broad range of uh, different kinds of historical developments, also chronologically speaking, a broad range of time. Uh, a good place to start, I think, is by defining our terms, right? So when we use the term imperialism, probably the simplest definition would be a policy or action by which one country controls another country or territory, often enough by military means, in order to gain economic and political advantages. So uh, the, the nature of that control could be direct, it could be indirect. Uh, these days we often talk about neo-imperialism with respect to American policy, uh, you know, where the United States is able to exert a certain degree of influence, but they don't directly control other countries. You know, historically, very often, it was much more uh, of a direct form of control. Related to that, we, we probably can talk about two different kinds of empire building processes, right? So first you have expansionism. Right. So, you know, for instance, if you're talking about the Russian Empire, right, the territories obtained by the mother country or the term we often use is metropole, uh, in this case, Russia, run adjacent to it. Right. So, you know, put in simple terms, you could pretty much walk from one end of the empire to another without ever having to get on a boat. Right. These territories are uh, all connected. Uh, another example then of expansionism would be the United States. We don't refer to it as uh, an empire. That, in, in many ways, so that actually is because we uh, eliminated indigenous populations, right? So that you don't have other nations that came under American control. Uh, but but expansionism applies pretty much equally to the Russian case and the American case, even if with different outcomes. Uh, by the way, the term metropole is referring to a mother country, quote unquote, uh, you know, just by uh, in terms of how it's often used in the literature. If you're reading about European colonialism, for instance, and so forth, uh, the term metropole very often referring uh, not just to the country, but also the capital. Right. So the metropole of the British Empire uh, might be considered to be London uh, or of the French Empire, Paris, kind of reflecting the fact that, you know, decisions uh, with respect to how to govern the empire, highly centralized, right, coming out of one point. Uh, we, you know, coming back to the distinction between uh, expansionism and colonialism, colonialism usually referring to empires where the territories obtained by the metropole are overseas, right, and the people in the territories in question then are understood as making up colonies, and there's kind of more of a sense that they constitute distinct units vis-a-vis -vis the mother country. Now, uh, if we're talking about European imperialism historically, we often break it down into two different phases or waves, right? The first wave of colonialism, uh, more or less corresponding to the Spanish and Portuguese empires, which uh, was the focus of, uh, I believe it was our uh, second or third lecture in this course. Sometimes we refer to the first wave of colonialism as the age of discovery, right? Which of course reflects very much a European perspective. Uh, Europe becoming aware of the Americas, uh, parts of the world uh, uh, hitherto unknown uh, by Europeans, right? So the first wave begins with Christopher Columbus's quote unquote, discovery of America. Uh, and so basically starting towards the end of the 15th century and then lasting until roughly the end of the 18th century. And at the forefront of this wave of colonialism would be Spain and Portugal. And as you might recall from our earlier lecture, uh, initially motivated by a desire to discover new sea routes to India and the Far East. They, they weren't aware that the Americas existed. Uh, and in fact, initially when, when Christopher Columbus encountered uh, encountered the so-called New World, wasn't aware that, uh, in fact, he hadn't made it to Asia. Uh, but, but, but very quickly, the Spanish and Portuguese became aware of the fact that this was, you know, completely new territory and would end up establishing vast empires in much of present-day South and Latin America. And you might recall that at some point, uh, in order to avoid conflict between the Spanish and Portuguese, they negotiated with the help of the papacy the Treaty of Tordesillas, whereby everything to the east of the line that you see drawn on that map would, would go to Portugal, everything to the west of the line 
would go to Spain. Of course, they, they didn't fully appreciate the fact that the vast majority of the landmass of the Americas was to the west of the line. Uh, so Spain uh, actually coming out uh, very much on top with that negotiation. Uh, but from that point forward, both were able to fully exploit uh, the territories they brought under their control, their new colonies, right? You might remember initially exploitation was largely centered around uh, gold and silver mines. At some point, though, we do start to see the development of agricultural settle, uh, settlements, uh, but that will never be as extensive in the Spanish and Portuguese colonies as what will take place in North America. And uh, to some degree, that reflects that other European powers are very quickly going to get on board with colonizing uh, the New World, right? By the early 1700s, the British, French, and Dutch had begun colonizing the Americas in addition to the Spanish and Portuguese, uh, in this case, mostly along the eastern coastline of North America, uh, and especially the British, right? Colonization is going to be, uh, to a much greater extent, about settler populations, large numbers of Europeans coming to the New World uh, and settling in the North American colonies, uh, and primarily engaging in agriculture. Uh, and finally, you know, not to leave out the Dutch, uh, the Dutch, of course, are going to settle in what at that time was known as New Amsterdam, what is presently known as New York, uh, but will also be fairly active. For a small country, they're going to settle many different parts of the world. So they're going to establish settlements in South America, uh, in Africa, most notably in South Africa, uh, and then in what will eventually become Indonesia and also parts of India. And on the subject of India, we should note the British are going to be fairly active in India as well from a, from a pretty early point, though to be more precise, it isn't going to be the British government engaging in colonial activity in India, but rather the British East India Company from a pretty early point, from the mid 1600s, establishing trading posts along the Indian coast uh, and then very quickly being given the right by King Charles II to exercise complete authority uh, legally, but, but in pretty much every respect as well, in areas that it brought under its control. Uh, such that by the last decade of the 17th century, you could say that uh, the company, as it was often simply referred to, was essentially its own nation on the Indian subcontinent. I always find this really fascinating, right? Like, you know, I've seen like some kind of, uh, you know, dystopian films of the future where corporations run the world. Uh, you know, this always seems like something very, well, maybe it's starting to feel pretty uh, realistic these days, right? But, you know, for a long time, this just seemed like kind of, uh, you know, something a little too fantastic to imagine. But in fact, if you go back to the 17th and then even coming into the 18th, uh, early 19th century, uh, centuries, you have actually uh, the situation whereby uh, what is essentially a continent, the Indian subcontinent, I mean, you know, as big as Europe, is under the control of a corporation. Uh, if any of you have ever seen any of the Pirates of the Caribbean films, right, the, I think it's the third film, uh, in some ways the arch nemesis in the film is the company, and in fact they are referring to the British East India Company. Uh, but, you know, the British are going to be active uh, throughout the globe, and, and it won't be long before the British are going to have the biggest empire that the world has ever seen, right? So, they're, you know, the, what you see here on this map uh, even reflects the situation after they lose the 13 colonies in North America, right? But they will still have colonies in what today is Canada. Uh, they will have colonies in, you know, we see that they're very rapidly uh, expanding their presence in India, uh, having colonies in parts of South America, in the southern tip of Africa. At some point, they're going to come into conflict with the Dutch there, uh, and of course, in Australia. And just by way of illustrating where things are headed, by 1897, the British Empire is indeed vast, right? The famous saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire, you know, simply reflecting the fact that uh, the extent of territory they brought under their control meant that, you know, at any given time, whatever the situation in Britain, somewhere the sun was shining on British soil. Now, up until a certain point, uh, the colonies in North America were definitely considered to be the most important colonies in the British Empire. Uh, and to a large extent, this reflected the, the, the fact that large numbers of Europeans, primarily British Europeans, had settled there. Uh, so you had these very, 
uh, you know, uh, expansive settler colonies in North America, uh, and very quickly developing their own societies. But but with you know feeling that they had a special connection to the mother country, uh, certainly uh, they they fulfilled the primary purpose of colonies quite well, which is to provide raw materials and markets. Uh, but you know part of the problem of having uh, settler colonies made up, uh, you know, of large numbers of Europeans is. Uh, as Europeans, they had certain expectations and kind of growing, uh, there would be a growing resentment uh, of, of the kind of limitations that were being set on them in terms of who they could trade with, what kind of economic development they could have and so forth. And eventually, you know, as we learned in a previous chapter, they're going to seek to throw off the control uh, of the mother country, right? Starting with the American Revolution. Uh, whereby the English colonies in North America became independent, becoming the uh, United States. Uh, but then very, uh, very quickly, other colonies in the Americas following suit, right? Such that by the second decade of the 19th century, pretty much uh, the vast majority uh, of the Americas uh, are independent. And initially, this would be of grave concern for, for respective mother countries, right? P uh, particularly the British, right? Who, you know, uh, not just governments, but, but many individual merchants, individuals who, whose economic well-being was very much tied to, you know, the fact that colonies were providing raw materials and markets for their manufactured goods and so forth. Uh, and so many of them were, were quite concerned when they lost the, uh, you know, in Britain were quite concerned when they lost the, the 13 colonies. Uh, but then at some point they, they, they came to realize that it wasn't quite the disaster they thought it would be, right? As it turned out, uh, the colonies, newly independent, still wanted to do business with them. And, and in many regards, business carried on pretty much as before. Uh, and from the point of view of the British government, with one really distinct advantage, right? They no longer had the burden of administering the colonies or the expense of doing so, right? The you know expense of militarily defending the colonies, uh, or of you know to some degree trying to impose British policy on them and so forth. And there would be a growing consensus that direct rule was actually more trouble than it was worth. Uh, Great Britain, in particular, would really adopt this position, right? Um, but other European powers would, would follow suit to one degree or another, right? And so the, you started to have, the, this is kind of defining European imperialism during the first half of the 19th century, uh, but growing support for what we might call informal empire, right? You don't have to directly control these territories to get what you want from them, right? So really, you know, a better approach would be to think very carefully, what is it that you actually want from the colonies? Usually, you know, first and foremost are raw materials <laughs> and markets. Uh, and then if you can somehow exert, uh, say, control over trade policies or, you know, have some measure of influence regarding their economic policies and so forth, uh, that is a much more efficient way to get what you want. Uh, and so this is very much going to define uh, how Great Britain deals with not just their former uh, colonies in North America, but with much of Latin America. Uh, and then with respect to the establishment of new trade relations in Africa and Asia. So for instance, in the Ottoman Empire, the British are never going to try to directly control any part of it. Uh, they're much more interested in exerting pressure on the Ottoman government uh, to pursue policies favorable to British interests. So among other things, this period, the first half of the 19th century, will see a slowing, a slowing down in colonial expansion. Uh, there are some exceptions. Probably the, the biggest exception is when Great Britain acquires Australia uh, in New Zealand. And these are obviously sizable territories. Uh, some of you probably know that initially Australia was used as a penal colony, uh, something I find Australians are very proud of. You know, it's kind of like a cool reputation, bad boy reputation. You know, we're all descendants of criminals and so forth. Uh, but that is kind of the one exception. Eventually, though, colonization is going to pick up again, right? Kind of this idea of having direct control over territories. A lot of this reflects the fact that the Industrial Revolution is really now getting underway and that it's getting underway uh, in many different European states, right? So things are becoming competitive. And then kind of linking into that is the rise of European nationalism. Uh, and so we'll, we'll kind of get into that in a bit, right? But, you know, to some degree, economic considerations are still at the forefront. 
right? Uh, so yes, informal empire, much preferred. Uh, but the problem becomes like, even if we don't need to directly control that territory, we don't want to see another European power do so either. Industrial nations need raw materials for their factories, markets for their manufactured goods. Uh, and, you know, colonies provide these, uh, but, but it's becoming very competitive now, right? Many different European states now uh, are competing for sources of raw materials, uh, for sources of markets and so forth. And then added to that, uh, in many of these countries, individual citizens, banks and so forth are beginning to invest in, in the economic development of territories abroad. Right. So European bankers, industrialists uh, find that you can make a lot of profit by investing in, uh, you know, it could be in Latin America, it could be in India, in different parts of Asia, by investing in factories, mines, plantations and railroads. But at some point, you're going to start putting pressure on your government to protect your interests. Uh, and primarily, you're thinking protecting your interests against uh, incursions by other European powers. Right. It's often the case that European nations desire end up desiring to secure the control of these territories uh, in order to protect these investments, in order to protect their economic interests, uh, but protecting from whom they're protecting them from other European powers. And that's where nationalism is really going to enter the picture, right? It's becoming very competitive. And by the end of the 19th century, you have this kind of, uh, you know, growing perception that you really just can't call yourself a great power unless you have colonies, right? So in some cases, we're even talking about, uh, you know, the populations of countries putting pressure on their government, uh, often through the media, uh, through editorials and so forth in the newspapers. Uh, to actually acquire colonies, to build up colonial empires, right? Britain very increasingly seen as kind of the model uh, of what a great European power looks like. And a big part of that is having a colonial, colonial empire. And that is going to be a major factor underlying the scramble for Africa that takes place during the late 19th century, uh, where, wherein uh, economic considerations actually kind of fell to the bottom of the list, right? There were kind of a host of other uh, considerations uh, at the uh, number one of which was national prestige, right? You know, and very often simply coming down to, you know, maybe we can live without it, but we can't live with someone else getting it. So I guess we have to get it first. And this brings us to the second wave, the age of imperialism, more or less corresponding to the 19th century, kind of initiated with the loss of the American colonies to the British, after which they're going to focus their efforts on expansion in Asia and then later Africa, right? So, you know, again, at the beginning of the century, economics, the primary consideration. And one thing that is becoming uh, very apparent is that colonies are not always beneficial economically, right? So first of all, as we already talked about, the British are beginning to recognize that you can still profit from trade, uh, for instance, with ex colonies, without having to pay for their defense and administration. And that is going to shape their attitude moving forward. Uh, by the way, that will also correspond to a willingness to allow uh, remaining settler colonies like in Canada, Australia, South Africa to become more self-governing, right? Uh, to the extent that these settlements are made up of Europeans, uh, you know, that they are dominated by white settlers, the British find that it actually, uh, British find that with respect to their economic interests, uh, it's actually, it actually works out much better if they allow them as much self-government as possible, right? Uh, given, you know, their background is coming from Europe and the fact that up until this point, they've already developed a lot of econo uh, economic ties with Britain. Uh, you know, th there's little danger of, of much of that changing by allowing them to self-govern. And, and then you don't have the cost of administering them or defending them. And this is going to correspond to what becomes the dominant British economic policy during the 19th century, laissez-faire liberalism, right? This really marks the point at which we have almost a complete break with mercantilism, right? You know, mercantilism, you know, kind of the idea that, you know, whatever colonies we have, uh, you know, whatever degree of self-government we permit them, we, we must at the very minimum assure uh, that, you know, all of their trading activity runs through us, right? The British are kind of moving away from that idea, you know, and that obviously corresponds to allowing for more self-government within 
uh, remaining colonies. Uh, the British are now all about free trade, right? Uh, and they're basically like, look, we are prepared to open our markets to everyone, to unfettered competition, uh, in the hopes that eventually other nations will do the same, inclusive of, you know, uh, whatever measure of control they might still have over over their colonies, right? So, you know, the idea of adopting a policy of free trade in the hopes of stimulating a, a reciprocal action uh, action by other countries. Uh, you know, this, this sounds all very uh, honorable, I suppose, you know, if you're an advocate of capitalism. Uh, but, you know, fr from the perspective of many uh, of the rival European states, you're like, well, that's all very well and good for you. At this point, the British are so far ahead uh, with regard to the Industrial Revolution, uh, that really no one else can compete with them, right? In terms of both, you know, the, the cheapness of British goods and the quality of British goods, right? And then added to that, you know, that the British are building up this vast colonial empire uh, with respect to, have, uh, to which they have this really impressive Royal Navy, uh, you know, that allows them to dominate the seas. Uh, so this policy of laissez-faire liberalism is, you know, really, if you think about it, very advantageous to the British. It really plays to their strengths. It will nonetheless uh, guide British policy, uh, particularly initially in the Americas, right? So we already learned a lot about British uh, activity in Latin America. Uh, the British, for instance, are also going to be strongly supportive of the United States when it issues its Monroe Doctrine in 1823 which basically declares that the new world, uh, now mostly independent, should be closed to colonization or European political interference. Uh, and the British support this because, you know, first of all, it uh, is totally compatible with this laissez-faire liberal approach that they've adopted. Uh, and, you know, more bluntly, it works to, to the British advantage. The British would also like to keep uh, the European powers out of Latin America, for instance, particularly the Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, you know, basically the British were able to enter these new markets uh, in these newly independent Latin American countries, uh, and they were quite happy to see them being independent, uh, and they, they were quite confident that, you know, in a, on a level playing field, they could compete with the other European powers uh, for their business. In the meantime, though, the British will be uh, engaging in a much more uh, conventional direct form of colonization in India, right? So, you know, first half of the 19th century, still India still being run effectively by the British East uh, India Company, uh, and then they run into a problem, right? So first of all, uh, in large part, they're able to maintain control of India by creating their own private army made up of native Indians, uh, often referred to as sepoys, which by the way is a term still used to refer uh, to infantry privates in the modern Indian, Pakistani, and Bangladeshi armies, right? So it's a, a basically an army made up of the indigenous inhabitants of India who are now being deployed in order to maintain their control of India. And as you might imagine, that could lead to some resentments. Uh, again, uh, this was explored in greater detail in one of the other chapters. And what eventually resulted, as we learned there, was the Indian Mutiny, or Sepoy Rebellion, where the army rebelled against British authority uh, in 1857. And, you know, the British were able to put it down. Uh, but from that point on, the British government decided that they needed to take direct control of India. They couldn't leave it in the hands of the British East India Company. It had become, it simply become too important to the British economy as a whole. And so from this point forward, will be directly governed uh, by the British government uh, as part of their empire, right? Wherein the uh, British monarch will even adopt the title of emperor, or I should say empress of India. And in fact, very often when we talk about the Indian colony of Britain, uh, we refer to it as the British Raj, uh, which perhaps is not a bad way to, uh, to think of it now, because uh, just to be clear, the colony of India much bigger than the modern nation state of India. It would have included what today is Pakistan, uh, here indicated as Baluchistan, uh, what today is Bangladesh, uh, which upon independence was actually part of Pakistan, uh, sometimes referred to as East Pakistan, uh, Burma, uh, Malaysia, uh, Ceylon, 
today's Sri Lanka, and then even extending uh, into the Himalayas to some degree. Right? So a vast colony, and definitely by the latter part of the 19th century, the crown jewel of the British Empire. Nonetheless, for most of the first half of the 19th century, the British by far the biggest imperial power on the planet and also leagues ahead of its, uh, you know, any potential competitor uh, with respect to industrialization, meaning also in competing with other European countries for raw materials and markets. As we get into the second half of the 19th century, however, things are really going to begin to change. Other powers are beginning to industrialize, and by the way, not just in Europe. We might also include here the United States and a little bit later Japan. Uh, and they are also going to put pressure on the respective governments to guarantee markets and sources of supply. Uh, so becoming much more competitive uh, in terms of colonization. Uh, but again, driven by industrialization, right? By the 1870s, British manufacturers are really beginning to experience uh, some genuine competition abroad. Two really good examples of this would be Germany, uh, only recently unified, though I should make clear it had been industrializing for quite some time before that, even before it became a unified state, uh, and the United States. Right, so the Germans by 1870, their textile and metal industries had actually surpassed British manufacturers. Uh, and you know, particularly if you're talking about textiles, that is uh, probably the most important manufactured product that the British were producing. Uh, with respect to the United States, really, it's more uh, really more about the fact that it's an incredibly large country. Uh, particularly following uh, its expansion westward. And so tremendous amount of raw materials, right? So, I mean, a, a tremendous source of wealth in that regard. But this is also all connecting with a growing sensibility that really you're not a great power if you don't have colonies. So some of this kind of reflects the status of Britain as this major imperial power, pretty much establishing a precedent that in order to be considered a major power, a nation should have colonies, uh, but also as the European states and you know, also the United States and later on Japan, as they industrialize, uh, they're simply becoming stronger, right? And you know, uh, the, the citizens of these countries kind of developing a sense of nationalistic pride, uh, commensurate with their economic and military strength. And again, right, this kind of idea that in order to be taken seriously, to be considered a great power, you should have colonies. Uh, so economic considerations will always remain a factor, right? Particularly to the extent that they connect with the economic strength of countries. Uh, but increasingly, they aren't necessarily the overriding consideration, right? So the one exception probably is Britain that really works very hard to kind of keep its eye focused on the ball, if you will. Uh, you know, th their empire largely a consequence of its economic policies. Uh, and so they try to, you know, to, to kind of keep economic considerations front and center. Uh, but in the case of France and then uh, some of the other European powers, uh, economic considerations, inc uh, considerations increasingly just one of many considerations as to why colonies are considered desirable. So at this point, we might look at some of the other colonial empires that are going to emerge during the 19th century, starting with the French. You know, the French Empire pretty much uh, the next most important one or biggest one after the British Empire. What's kind of interesting in the French case is at the beginning of the century, they're really starting from square one, right? Following the ousting of Napoleon in 1814, you might remember we had the restoration of the Bourbon dynasty, uh, hence why we refer to the period as the restoration. Uh, there we see Charles X, who you might recall was eventually forced to abdicate uh, following the July Revolution of 1830. Uh, but by the time we get to the Restoration, pretty much the French uh, are starting from scratch, right? What do they have? They basically have two islands in the Caribbean, Guadalupe and Martinique, which granted are important producers of sugar, uh, but not, not a basis for, you know, kind of uh, bragging about your great power status. And they have Senegal in Africa. You might recall they had lost most of their colonies in North America uh, during the Seven Years' War. They did regain them temporarily, but then Napoleon had sold uh, the Louisiana Purchase uh, to the United States in 1803. 
So where to begin? Well, right across the Mediterranean uh, and ripe for the picking is Algeria, which no other European power has laid claim to. And so this new French colonial empire will basically begin with the invasion of Algeria in 1830. So the actual pretext for this invasion, which started with the French bombardment of the city of Algiers that year, uh, was that France has suffered a diplomatic insult, uh, something involving a you know, uh, French diplomat being slapped in the face with a white glove. You know, obviously that was not the reason why France ended up invading Algeria and then eventually occupying it. Uh, I should note, it's going to be a drawn out process. Things really take off after Napoleon III comes to the throne. And that's probably not surprising if we consider, you know, once again, we talked about how he always felt his pressure to live up to the reputation of his uh, more famous uncle, Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, but probably a major factor in, you know, why the French become so focused on Algeria. And in this regard, uh, very different than most European colonies, you're going to end up with a large French settler population in Algeria. Right? When I say different from most colonies, I mean during the second wave, uh, the, the age of imperialism. Right? During the first wave, uh, you know, having large European settler populations was actually more common. That isn't something you're seeing a lot of uh, during the 19th century. You're not going to see a lot of, for instance, British people going to live in India. Australia, New Zealand, possibly the, uh, the two most important exceptions. Well, in any event, at some point, the French have occupied Algeria pretty much completely. Uh, later on, they're going to move into neighboring Tunisia. In the meantime, they're also going to begin colonizing Southeast Asia. In September 1858, France occupies da, da Nang, a port city on the southern coast of Vietnam. Uh, and then on February 18th, 1859, the French conquer Saigon and three southern Vietnamese provinces. Uh, before long, they've conquered most of Southeast Asia. Uh, 1867, Cambodia has made a, a protectorate of France. Uh, and then from their base in Cochin, China, the French will uh, go on to take control of Tonkin and Annam, uh, so kind of completing their conquest of territory corresponding to modern day Vietnam. Uh, and then, you know, all of this actually is kind of brought together into what is at that time was known as French Indochina, uh, later adding Laos in 1887 and then Quang Chuan in 1900. Uh, alongside that, we might note that the French gain a concession uh, in Shanghai in 1849, right? But that comes at the expense of China. So the French becoming a major presence in Southeast Asia. And in the meantime, continuing to expand uh, in North Africa. Uh, eventually, they will take Morocco, though, by the way, Morocco is actually going to hold out for some time. Uh, they will be one of the few remaining independent states in Africa coming into the 20th century. We're going to learn more about what happens there. Uh, the French are also going to become very active uh, in all of West Africa, right? So on the other side of the Saharan Desert from Algeria. Uh, but, but that's pr a pretty good place to stop. That, that kind of marks the end of the first part of our lecture. Uh, and we'll kind of pick up the story in the second part, looking at the development of a few other colonial empires.